faithful it is to me. This is number 180 in our hymn books. We'll go to that last stanza, number three. Love beyond all human comprehending. Love of God and Christ, how can it be? This will be my theme and never ending. Great redeeming love of Calvary. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Come on up here, boys and girls. Let's sing a song together. We're going to sing, Oh, Oh, Wonderful Love. So come on up here and help me sing this song today. If you don't know it, we'll learn it. Oh, Oh, Wonderful Love. Oh, Oh. You can do that. Oh, Oh, Oh. Okay. All righty. We're going to sing, The Love of Jesus is So Wonderful. How are you? So, like, just love Jesus. Wonderful. Okay, here we go. The love of Jesus is so wonderful. The love of Jesus is so wonderful. The love of Jesus is so wonderful. Oh, oh, wonderful love. Okay, it's higher than the mountains, deeper than the ocean wider than the universe oh oh wonderful love Woo-hoo! excellent singing very nice well done spectacular marvelous don't get hurt nobody gets hurt. there we go all right wow is the sound working now did i push the right button most excellent all right thank you we have an outline for this morning. So if you uh, get one of those outlines, it'd be most excellent. It's good to be here today. We are still in the VBS mode, as you can see. We're going to be reorganizing our VBS storage unit. And of course, with the Labor Day weekend, several folks were unavailable to take care of that over the weekend and so I said don't even worry about it I love preaching in front of the wilderness so uh, we're one more how's that how's, what's that sermon one more night with the frogs I've heard that sermon before anyway one more night in the wilderness and um, looking forward to uh, some folks in our way getting back but we're in Ephesians chapter 5 this morning if you take your Bibles turn over there um, we we uh, going through talking about ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, and talked about some uh, pretty, pretty um, important doctrinal distinctions of independent Baptist churches that we believe that the church is, an, is a visible church. It's a local visible body of believers, just one definition of a church as compared to uh, some others that uh, that uh, group the church in with uh, the kingdom of God and make it universal and others uh, even taking it further and making it uh, universal and invisible and they talk about a the local church and they talk about the universal church and they have multiple definitions for what a church is and um, we hold to um, a um, a local uh, body of believers and each one of the Lord's churches are, uh, have the Lord Jesus Christ as their head. And this is what we've been talking about, the nature of the church. Last week, we ta- or last, you know, two weeks ago, I think it was, anyway, we were talking about the body. And uh, today, we're going to be talking about another statement that's made in the Scriptures in reference to the nature of the church. And that's found in Ephesians chapter 5, okay? So, uh, if you would, please. I, I do want to mention that when we talk about the church... Um, a lot of the things that we've been speaking about with the church are not salvation issues, and I, and I understand that. Um, not everything that we believe doctrinally affects uh, our salvation message. And matter of fact, you know, I was saved in a church that did not believe in a local, uh, simply a local church. Matter of fact, it was a universal church in its doctrine, uh, supported all kinds of... I never met an independent Baptist missionary until I moved to Missouri. 
And uh, every missionary that I ever met was out of a, was out of a board. Uh, never, most of them were never sent out of local churches. Uh, so I was never experienced with that. I had a conversation with Brother Will Height while he was here. We were talking about a mutual friend of ours, Brother, Brother Mike Meredith. And Mike is a, is a missionary in Australia also, but he's on the other side of Australia from where the Will Heights are at. And Brother Jerry said, you know, I'm, I've never met Brother, Brother Mike Meredith. I said, oh, man, I've known Mike for 30 years. And, and um, those guys correspond to one another across the country of Australia, but they've never met. Those two got to get together and get to know each other a little bit better. But uh, when we moved to Missouri, I met Mike Meredith, and uh, he, uh, he told me he was a missionary to Australia. He was on his first furlough. And I said, oh, what board are you out of? He said, well, I'm not out of a board. We're out of Berean Baptist Church, and we're, uh, you know, we're directly out of that church. I said, I've never met a missionary sent directly out of a church before. And um, so Mike said, well, let me explain to you what that's all about. And I had a great conversation with him. He's the first independent Baptist missionary I ever met. And I'm just saying that to say this, is the church I got saved in had no uh, position on what, um, had a, did not have a strong position on what local, what church doctrine was all about. But it didn't affect the gospel message. I got saved through the preaching of the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I would never stand and say that churches that don't hold to particular doctrinal positions like on, a, on church doctrine don't preach, a, a, don't preach a good salvation message. They certainly can and they certainly do. And many folks get saved. I'll take it even another step and say, because we just finished talking about uh, doctrine of the church. I'll even say that, excuse me, doctrine of the Bible. I would even say that even churches that don't hold to a solid King James uh, position um, I, I, I would never say that they would never be able to lead anybody to Christ. Um, I certainly do believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God, period. Uh, I will say other versions contain the Word of God, and I make a distinction about that. But uh, there are certain doctrinal positions we hold to uh, that I, I believe are essential and important to our operation of the church and how it functions and what we do. Um, but... You know, not necessarily, you know, if you don't hold to them, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not preaching a good gospel or salvation message. So um, I, I do want to say that, and, but I do hold to the fact that these doctrines are important because they do affect the way you practice as a church. And our goal, of course, is to pattern our ministry according to the first century church, period. And what does the Word of God say? How's the church pictured in the, in the scriptures? What are the commandments specifically to the churches? And then we have to apply those things and follow them. So we're responsible to do what this book says as far as how we operate as a church. And so to me, every doctrine then becomes important because it has to do with obedience to the word of God and obedience to the commands of Christ. And so, you know, we're talking about the church. I hope you understand that our goal is simply to discern what the scripture says put it into practice here in our ministry, and then allow God to bless accordingly. And so when we're talking about the nature of the church, uh, we've been talking about the fact that it's a body. It is a local body with Jesus Christ as its head. And this morning we're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, and, and I would direct you to verse number 21 as we're going to start there. And I'm going to read down through several verses. Just remain seated, please, as we get started with this. Christ... Uh, of course, uh, is the head of the church. And we, we spoke about that from back in the book of Colossians. But here he, he begins this, um, uh, Paul is writing to um, uh, the church there in Ephesus. So this is, a, this is a, a letter to a local church. It says, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then he begins from here and begins to talk to husbands and wives. In chapter 6, he talks to children. Uh, he goes on and talks to servants and, and masters. You can think about it as employers and employees at this point. Uh, but in, here in verse number 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Uh, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it 
to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his own, uh, excuse me, loveth, um, <laughs> let me get that right. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, uh, but nourisheth and cherisheth cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord. Pray that you'd bless this morning that we have in Sunday school. And I just want to thank you, Lord, for providing the time uh, that we have set apart this Lord's Day uh, to spend some time in the scriptures. Um, I know the Father's uh, holiday weekend, there's some folks away, and I do pray for safety for many that are traveling. And I do want to thank you, Lord, that uh, you've allowed us to be able to be here today. Now open up our eyes and our hearts to truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the particular, uh, as you can see in your outline here, the, bot, uh, the church is like a spouse, and he's making this correspondence between a husband and a wife to uh, the Christ and his church. And so um, as we talk about this, um, uh, these two parallels, of course, a lot of things go back and forth with that as we make as we observe the church and how it operates and, and with with Christ and we make those applications to a marriage situation. And of course we observe a marriage situation. We make those applications to the church in Christ. And so that's why the parallel is drawn. And, and Paul is really good at, at illustrating things he used at the body uh, last we talked about last couple of weeks to illustrate what the church is like and the members in particular. And here is just another very practical illustration that's being used. And, and most people certainly can identify with that, whether they're married or not, because of course, they, everyone's born into uh, you know some uh, some type of family setting, and there's a, all everyone knows about married couples and relationships and things like that. So it's something that applies to everyone, and we understand this operation. And so that this um, um, it starts by talking about submission. I want to probably I'm going to Lord will talk a little bit more about submission last week. I'm going to talk about the the something a little bit more uh, here in just a second. But it begins by talking about submission. Uh, submission, uh, what submission is not, is a submission is not a weakness where one just kind of cowers and say, "Well, whatever you want." Uh, submission is, as I, I guess, a, you know, scripture defend, uh, defining itself. As you look at, of course, that that is mentioned in verse number twenty-two about the wives submitting yourselves to your own husbands, and you see down in verse number thirty-three, the wife um, speaking of here, see that she reverence her husband. It is a respect. Uh, a reverence or a respect of authority. Um, it has to do with the Lord's desire to keep the home organized. Uh, somebody has to be responsible. That's what it comes down to. And, uh, you know, uh, we can identify with that at many levels uh, in our lives. Uh, folks that are in the military, there is an, there is an order uh, of responsibility. Uh, just because somebody becomes a, a general doesn't mean they're a better person, a better man, or a better woman than someone who is, you know, even down to a private. It doesn't talk about, it's not about character, it's, not, it's about responsibility. You are responsible. A husband is responsible for the household and ultimately has to make uh, the decisions uh, and simply what the scripture is talking about is wives, uh, a wife understanding uh, that, that that husband is going to give an account to God and he is ultimately responsible for what takes place. That does not um, throw out the door any kind of discussion or opportunities of expressing opinions. I certainly um, respect my wife's opinion um, for, for many things. As a matter of fact, there are so many times where we've disagreed on something and I've gone and done something anyway, and, and you, you end up eating crow eventually by saying, you know, I should have just did it her way. That would have been the best thing to do. Oh, Brother Denny's identifying with that one. But actually, he likes to eat crow, I think, is what it is. 
It has to do with his dietary needs more than anything. But uh, anyway, um, the, um, the, the idea of submission is, uh, is not, you know, lay over, play dead and say, you know, you just take care of it and I don't care what you do, type, or even that type of mentality. It is not. It is a respect and a response to a position which the Lord has defined within the, within the, in the family. We'll, we'll talk about that some more, maybe next week or sometime in the future. My primary uh, thing I want to talk about today is sanctification, and you'll see that in verse number 26. Um, then he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And, he, and here, here he makes this, um, this, again, this parallel um, and so a man and a woman, they're, uh, they're, they're going to get married. Um, of course, a man, uh, in the context here, he's talking about the fact of this marriage. And, of course, a husband wants a wife that is going to be clean and pure. And we're talking about morally, primarily. And so um, he makes this parallel that the, that the bride ought to be clean. And so... Talk about presenting himself. I, I just, just by way of a, just a little bit of cultural background, um, for the Jewish setting, um, when they, when a, when a couple was engaged, they were considered to be married. Now that marriage would ultimately um, have a ceremony, but at it, at the engagement uh, that we would use the word engagement, uh, they were considered a couple. And matter of fact, a, a writing of divorcement would have to be written even to break off an engagement. That's how serious the Jewish law was. And so there was um, this idea of this maintaining of this purity. As a matter of fact, you know, the Bible makes it really clear uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the story of, of Mary and Joseph and leading to the birth of Christ. And they were, uh, they were a spouse. They were not married yet as you know, the ceremony and, and had uh, consummated a marriage at, at all. Uh, but she was found to be with child. And so, so here, here is, here's Joseph uh, thinking his wife is impure, haven't had the marriage yet. And, and so wanting to, to put her away privately. It could have got worse. I mean, he could have actually had her stoned to death if he really wanted to push the issue. And so there is, um, there's this understanding of this desire of purity, even at the beginning of the relationship, which, of course, then lead through the entirety of the relationship. If you're familiar with the book of, um, of Hosea, yeah, you, hear, you read about the prophet Hosea, who's commanded by God to marry uh, Basically, marry a prostitute. We have we we meet uh, Gomer, uh, and and there's impurity that runs through it. And the reason for that is God wanted to point out uh, to the nation of Israel the impurity by which they entered. They were in this relationship with God, and God wanted them to be a pure people. And yet they go, uh, as the term is used throughout, uh, a whoring after. Uh, other gods and, and being impure in their relationship with God, immoral uh, in that sense where they're chasing after other gods instead of, uh, of uh, being solely for, uh, for God himself, God the Father. And, and so, so we, have, we have this great picture that's painted here. So when we talk about sanctification, it's mentioned here, verse number 26. I'll give you just a, this is a really basic definition of the word sanctification or sanctify. It means to make holy. That's the basic definition, to make holy. And um, definition of sanctify. Um, the idea is something being set apart for God. Um, often people use uh, a term for this room right here that we're in as a sanctuary. And it comes from the same root. And the reason they call it a sanctuary is because this room is set apart for us to meet with God. Sanctuary. Um, that's, the, that's the term that's being used. Okay, To sanctify, uh, as far as a, the Bible is concerned, it has to do with having something that's set apart for God himself. Now, the, uh, the illustration, of course, uh, a great illustration for that is the temple itself. The temple was designed and built for this idea of, of it being, this is where we met with God, the temple and, of course, the tabernacle in the wilderness. I do have that reference back in Numbers chapter 7, and if you go back there really quickly, Numbers chapter 7, and um, somebody, uh, uh, Brother Stephen, are you there yet? Could you uh, just kind of give us a lowdown? Numbers chapter 7, verse number 1, you can read that for us. Sanctified them. 
All righty. And so, there, so there's a term that's being used. And so to anoint, uh, it says, and then to sanctify. So to sanctify, now it, it's talking about the vessels thereof, um, the instruments thereof. So we're talking about everything. So like, like for instance, in the tabernacle, um, we all talk about the big furniture, you know, like the, uh, the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was at. The Ark of the Covenant would be there, the table of showbread, the candlesticks, the altar of incense, the laver where they wash things, and the brazen altar uh, was there. But there are other things. Um, um, anybody ever have a, anybody have a wood stove or have had a wood stove in their lifetime? Okay. Oh, my. I've had a few. Okay. I got the scars to prove it, too, from pushing wood inside of them. Um, but um, one of the things you, what do you, what do you keep by the wood stove? Wood. What else do you keep by the wood stove? Shovel. Shovel. Bucket. One of those for moving logs around so you don't burn your arm going in there after them. And uh, learn your lesson. Um, those are the, there's the instruments, okay? So even in, even in, the, in the temple or in the, in the tabernacle, you know, you think about the big stuff, but they're, they're little things. And everything that was actually used in the temple or tabernacle was actually set apart particularly for the use there. So, for instance, okay, now this, I, this happens to us because, uh, you know, Mrs. Shorter and I, we're, we're often over here at the church doing stuff, and, you know, Joyce always is helping to prepare for church fellowships and things like that all the time, okay? And it's just, it, this happens a lot. We'll be at home, and Joyce will be in the kitchen making something, and she'll stay, where is so-and-so or whatever, you know, my favorite butcher knife or whatever. And she'll like, oh, man, it's at church, okay? Because she took it to church, and we used it for church fellowship. It's in the kitchen somewhere, you know, stuck in some drawer or whatever. And she's like, hey, would you mind driving over to church and getting whatever? And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'd just love to because I'd drive by the Wawa and get coffee on the way. It's just wonderful. <laughs> and, and so it's, it would, it's a very common thing for us to go back and forth like that, right? Well, see, we don't think about that a lot, but tabernacle and, tu- and temples, it's like Aaron, the high priest, didn't go home, and Mrs. High Priest wasn't sitting there, you know, making, you know, goat stew and thinking to herself, oh, where? Where is my favorite butcher knife? Oh, that's right. Aaron, you let so-and-so use my favorite butcher knife to kill the last sacrifice there, so go back to the temple and get my butcher knife. That would never happen, (laughs) okay? Because when something was set apart and sanctified, it was specific. It's going to be used here. It's going to be used for this function, and it's not going to leave this place. It was very specific. And so in the Old Testament, uh, and you see the temple and tabernacle, everything that was sanctified was solely separated for God for his use and not to be used in any other way, shape, or form, period. Set apart. And so this is, that, this is the word that's being used. Now, here is, here, here's somewhat of a, a dilemma, okay? I have another reference down here, and this is from, in the book of Haggai. And, of course, that's where our last month's memory verse is. And, Brother Stephen, I do have to apologize. I didn't, I didn't make it to our memory verse last uh, on Thursday. And so uh, you get to introduce it today, all right? I hope, I hope you're not heartbroken. And so um, I've had a few people ask me already, what's the memory verse? Because they want to get an early start. Um, Haggai, <laughs> I'll get there. Take it. There we go. Man, took a wrong turn to Zephaniah. All right, Haggai chapter 2. And um, so, you know, where we're reading out the book of Numbers, that's like way back in the beginning when the temp, uh, tabernacle was first being built in the wilderness. Now we're way down the road. Uh, the tabernacle is not being used. The temple was built. Matter of fact, the temple was destroyed and rebuilt. And uh, by the time we make it up to uh, Haggai and Zechariah, you know, the, the, uh, the temple's being rebuilt uh, after the Babylonian captivity. And they're talking about a lot of things in reference to uh, the temple itself 
uh, and um, the need for um, a holy separated life. And let's see here. I'm in Haggai chapter 2, verse number 10. Yes, and in the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of God, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai the prophet, and um, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, with the skirt, um, with his skirt, do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat. Shall it, be, uh, shall it be holy? And the priest said, answered and said, no. So, okay, get the, get the idea, all right? So the priest, they do carry a lot of things around, so he's got his, got his holy garment on, okay? My holy garment on. And so, um, matter of fact, let me see here. Sir, Phoebe, come on up here. I need somebody to put this on and be floating on him, okay? This will be floating on you, wouldn't it? Here, try that on, see if it fits. Very good. Okay, so um, so if this this is a loaf of bread, by the way. Okay, just the way I like it. All right. So um, so just hold the hold the thing out there the best you can. Like oh, there you go. All right. So so if, if the, for the priest they would put on a garment. Now everything they wore stayed there. Okay, so they would, they would take certain garments off and on as they came in the temple and tabernacle because they were holy. They were set apart specifically for the, for the use in the, in, the, in the ceremonies and stuff. And, and so something would come in, and so they would, they would carry it about. So if, if this garment is holy, does it make that holy is the question. So if they, if they touch it, um, is, is it, does the holiness transfer from one thing to another? And, and the answer, of course, as you read there, it says, no, it doesn't make it holy. All right, simply something holy touching it does not make it holy. Um, so that is not holy. Can it be made holy? Certainly. You know, anything that was donated, given to the temple, it could be presented before God. The, they had things they needed to do, but it could be considered to be holy. But simply association didn't make it holy. Now, please look at the next verse. Brother Stephen, would you mind? I think that was, what, 10? And uh, where are we at? Okay, keep going. Then said Haggai, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these... Okay, I... hang on one second. So, Phoebes, all right. Is there a dead... Oh, look at this dead quail over here. All right, it's now a dead quail. All right, so um, one of the requirements for priests um, is... Um, there was a, a, a need for, to maintain cleanliness. So if they touched a dead body, there was a ceremony they had to do go through cleansing. So, I mean, that would include everything, you know, anything that was dead. That would even, that would even include if they had a, a funeral to attend and they had to deal with, uh, you know, a dead relative. They were considered to be unclean for a certain period of time and there were certain things they had to do. So, you know, Phoebe's on, she's on her way to the temple, Okay. And, uh, and there was this dead quail laying there, and she's thinking to herself, man, it looks like dinner for tonight, okay? So she picks the dead quail up. Please go right ahead and pick that dead quail up, okay? And, uh, you know, puts it, uh, puts it in her uh, dead quail bin over here. Oh, look at that box. Stick it right in that box. She's going to save that for later. Excellent. I love VBS. Always leaves great plops. So she's now touched this dead quail. She's going to save for later. She comes to the temple, puts her robe on there. She's ready to do her work, but she has, she's unclean. Ceremonially, I'm talking about from the scriptures. Okay, this is Old Testament stuff, all right? So she's ceremonially unclean. It's the Levit Levitical law that she just violated. Didn't think a thing about it because all she cares about is lunch. Quail. Quail burgers, Okay. Who was that? Who, who said, it was Brother Sean who said that, that Aaron, the Aaron, uh, excuse me, Moses started Chick-fil-A and, and using manna to make the burgers and using quail to make, uh, like, you know, ch you know, the chicken sandwiches, chicken sandwiches out of quail. So if you, if you weren't here for VBS, you missed a great lesson that day. And um, so anyway, so she's going to make her, uh, Phoebe's going to make her quail burgers later, but she's now unclean. So... She's going about, her, she's going about her, her work, right? Now, what happens? Read that again. 
Then said Haggai, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Okay. And, and so now what has happened is we have loaf of bread here, something that's been given, something to be used in the tabernacle, something to be devoted to God, something to be, you know, um, something to be offered to God. Um, before she was clean and touched it, it doesn't fix, it doesn't make it clean, but it can be used to do the work that God wanted it to do. But now she is unclean because she touched that dead quail. And now she's about the op same operation, doing the work of God. But now what she has now touched is now unclean because she's unclean. The work she is trying to do for God has been contaminated by her own actions. And now what she is doing for God is now not suitable to be done for God because it's now unclean. So what we have is when we talk about sanctification, and, and we're, I'm just using the parallel of the Old Testament and the tabernacle and the temple. And the idea was when something was set apart for God, it had to be clean and it had to maintain its, its cleanliness. So if, if a priest went and touched something that was unclean, he had, he, the Bible made provision for that. This is how you fix that. And this is what you have to do to be clean again. And now everything that you do can be clean. Um, but if you don't do that, then the, the sin is now passed along to the service. It's now unclean. So the idea of sanctification has to do with having something that is clean and suitable and usable to God. Now, I, I, I just want to say, we're not under the Levitical law, okay? So, you know, if you found, uh, you know, some dead animal on the way to church, you want to throw it in your trunk and save it for later, go for it, Okay. I know Brother Denny's done that many times, okay? And uh, heard the stories, man. Yeah, I, know. I know. So um, that we're not under the Levitical law, all right? But it's a great illustration because for them, that word sanctify was a real tangible thing because when they went into the temple, whether it be the priest to serve or whether it be an individual that's going there to worship, there was a necessity that they were, they were clean, that they were suitable to serve God. And, and so, Phoebes, thank you very much. Give her a big hand. Thank you very much. Save the quails for later. Quails for, quails for lunch. Here's where we're at. Um, I'm making the application individually as well as corporately. So if, if you as an individual and us as a church, okay? Um, this is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a pure church in reference to the fact that we entered into this relation with God in a proper way. And so um, we began as a pure church. And, and so the work that we do as a church, um, in other words, what, we, what we're able to do, the outcome of that is all to, to the glory of the Lord. It, it's, it's to his honor and glory. But the problem is, is that the church needs to maintain its purity. <clears throat> we need to continue to be sanctified. Because there, there will come a time when there's, an, where there's uncleanness. <clears throat> and it has to be dealt with. And if it's not, then, then the outcome um, becomes contaminated. The, 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 um, the garments, are, if you would... Um, when it's uh, when it the things that it's involved in or touches now becomes unholy, not set apart for God anymore. The outcome becomes something that is impure. So I mean that can be seen in several different ways. Yes, sir. So I have a very con controversial subject. That oh, great! I love controversial so, subjects on Sunday mornings for so, Sunday school. So when it comes to like being non-registered as a church, and oh, you're talking about governmental registration. Yeah. I think that's bogus. But go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm, what I'm saying, well, let me see this. I think the folks that, that oppose uh, legislation um, are going against Scripture. Okay? 
But you're talking about reg, you know, registering churches and things like that. We're registered. We have, we're incorporated. And, you know, we follow all the proper paperwork. And I believe if you're going to live in the land, then you have to respect the laws of the land, period. So, yeah, it is a very controversial subject. I'm going to shut you down so quick about it. But I get so irritated when folks start going off on that one. Because, you know, I, I mean, I, I'll honor Caesar. And as long as he stays out of my business, then we're good. So, so as soon as Caesar starts saying what I can't do and, I, and it violates the scriptures, then I would say we need to do something. But we've not been like that in this land, which is fantastic. There are other countries like China where they have to maintain that separation and not register. Because once they register, then the government controls what they're preaching. And, uh, and there are other countries like that, too. We're not, we're not even close to that in this country. So, yeah. So maintaining our purity as a church, I don't believe would, uh, that, would, that would be a part of that. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly, Ryan. And um, it is, uh, that's a big subject for a lot of folks. But, I, I, you yeah, I got, know, I got a strong opinion about that one. So only, well, anyway, let me move on from there. All right, so the, the idea of maintaining purity has to do with the fact that we, we understand that we're, we, um, we're not going to allow the world to contaminate us as a church. So how does, how does the world contaminate a church? I mean, if we're, we're talking about purity. How does the world contaminate a church? Brother Tyler. Like false doctrine creeping in? False doctrine creeping in is certainly one of them. Uh, and, I mean, they're, they're, talking about full gamut. Sorry about that, guys. I'm talking about full gamut. Boy, he's sitting back there going, oh, oh. All right. I fidget a lot, sorry. Hands off. Um, there's full gamut of doctrine. So, I mean, there's a lot of things you talk about. False doctrine is always a part of it. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, Brother Manny? I was going to say status. Uh, that, has a, that, that certainly can, too, because there is a lot of church, churches that do want so, uh, social status in, in, in so many different ways. And um, a, lot of, a lot of churches become more social clubs than anything. And, and so... Um, when that happens, usually what diminishes is uh, the preaching of the word, um, le- less and less about um, doctrine and a strong presentation of the word of God, and it become sometimes a social gospel or just you know having you, you want a, you want a big church, you want recognition, those type of things. Certainly that creeps in there. Yes. Just undealt with sin in the church. Undealt with sin. Yeah. Um, not preaching against sin. Because when you preach against sin, people leave. You know, they either get right or they leave. Christian Joy? Thinking the focus of the service, so like having a 10 minute service sermon and like an hour of Yeah, so it becomes more entertainment and things like that. See, all those type of things <coughs> are things that creep into the church. And all, it just, you know, it's, it's often just a little bit at a time. Um, it's very often been said, and certainly is true, and I've witnessed it myself, that every church is like one pastor away from disaster. Um, and so, uh, you know, somebody, somebody's going to come in and they're going to change a lot of things about the ministry. And all of a sudden, you know, you find the church is doing stuff. As you, as you read through the book of Revelations, of course, you know, this, uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3, you see the letters of the seven churches of Asia, and you begin to see some of the some of the things, some of the patterns that often show up in different churches about you know the way they operate. They, they think they're rich, but they're actually you know they're, they're actually you know they're poor and they're and they're blind and they're and they're naked um, because they allow certain things to creep in. It, it's this this lack of sanctification. That that word sanctification has to be being set apart for God. And, and so what, what's happening is things are creeping in, things are contaminating the church, and then what happens is what they touch then becomes unholy. In other words, what they're involved in produces things that are not glorifying to God. They may produce a lot of stuff. You might be able to you know, fill the pews. You may be, uh, get a lot of attendance, a lot of recognition. You, know, uh, you, know, you get a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff going on, um, but, the, but what is being done is not necessarily glorifying to God. The church needs to be a sanctified church. It has to be clean and pure and uncontaminated by the world. And so the, uh, the means by that, of course, um, in verse number, uh, is it verse number 26, ba- way back in our text, I'm sorry, and um, um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 26, the means by that is that might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water by 
the word. And so the, 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 the importance of the word of God is essential to this work of sanctification, something being set apart by God. The word of God is being preached. When the word of God is preached, it has an impact because uh, the word of God is quick and it's powerful. Uh, we're not talking about telling, you know, little moral stories. Uh, you know, ver- you get start with a verse of scripture and, and just go off on some tangent somewhere. The idea, of course, of the preaching of the word of God is to present truth um, that's found, in, of course, rooted in the scriptures and present the word of God as it is found um, for folks to be able to take it in, to feast on it, to learn, to grow, to be convicted because the word of God convicts us. Uh, it, sh- it exposes things. It's a, it's a light that shines in a dark place. Um, sin is being dealt with. Folks are confessing things. You make, um, you know, we've been talking about the pattern of the New Testament church and, and what it is and how it functions. We're going to talk a lot more in detail about that. But if, you know, if we're going to operate as a church and we want to do it right, we have to do it according to Scripture. So here you have the temple, of course, and again, back to that parallel where the, you know, the, the priests, they, here they had this great responsibility of all these sacrifices and cleansing. And then they had the bread and they got candles and they got sprinkling blood and all those type of things. But they, they learned how to do it from the Scriptures. And they continue to do it for thousands of years based on the Scriptures. And it's just an amazing thing. You get to a place like the number, excuse me, uh, uh, New, um, Nehemiah chapter 8, and they're reading the Word of God, and folks are breaking down, and they're crying, and they're saying to themselves, look, you know, and they, they, they understood how much they've neglected from the Word of God. They wanted to get, Nehemiah is wanting them to rejoice. So we finally got the Word of God, and we're preaching it. We're here back in Jerusalem. And the folks are just bawling because they, under such conviction by hearing what the Word of God says. And, and uh, it seems like every time the Word of God had been neglected, folks started falling into sin. And when the Word of God was found again and preached, folks got under conviction and got things right. They purified themselves. And, and it is essential for the church to be a pure church. And the church cannot be a pure church except that the, that the Word of God is presented. Now, certainly that happens. Uh, in order to be a pure church, a church has to, be, has to have a saved membership, okay? Now, we, we talked about this, uh, I don't know, that was a, oh, so a while back. We were talking about bad hermeneutics uh, and how the Catholic Church interpreted uh, some portions of Scripture in, in, the, in the, some of the parables because um, they don't believe that you have to have a pure membership uh, in that sense. But, um, you know, the Bible talks about the fact that, that, that there has to be salvation. As many as received this word, were baptized, and were added unto them. And even the Ethiopian eunuch in, in Acts chapter 8, when he's talking to Philip, Here water, here's water, what does hinder me from being baptized? If thou believest, thou mayest. You know, just even being baptized, there has to be this testimony of salvation that they've truly been born again. I believe that Jesus is the, the Son of God. And, and um, we, we are, uh, I'm just reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 22. Seeing that we are uh, purif- uh, seeing, seeing ye have purified your souls uh, in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto an unfeigned love of the brethren, uh, that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's the word of God that, that saves us. We are, we are born again by the word of God. We are purified. Our souls are purified. We're cleansed. And that's that picture of that sanctification, the ritual, if you would, of the Old Testament, this using of water to wash and to cleanse, and then all of a sudden, you know, we've been, um, we've been, uh, we've been washed and cleansed. Now, you know, the, 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 it's, I'm, I'm reading from Titus chapter 3, verse number 5. It says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy, Holy Ghost, this washing of regeneration. In other words, we are, this, this regen, this being born again is what cleanses us. We're made right with God. So there has to be this, this constant need 
of course, to understand that the church needs to be made up of those that are truly been born again. That's where it starts. And that's, you know, that, that verse of scripture we read way back in Numbers chapter 7, when, they, when they, everything was built, what did they do? They sanctified. They, 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 made, they went through and they did what they needed to do to make sure that every instrument was suitable to be used in the, in the temple. When we look at the Lord's church, we want to see, is it a pure church? Are the folks that are a part of it truly born again? And this is what our aim is. Not just to you know, fill pews with folks, uh, but to make sure that folks are truly born again. And um, another thing that we need to do is to maintain the, the purity of the church itself, of those that are a part of it, okay? Um, um, if, if you would, um, and we're getting low on time here, but um, uh, Proverbs chapter, excuse me, no, I'm sorry, Psalms 119, uh, beginning in, in that second section, which is verse number 9, Psalm 119, beginning in verse number 9, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's, it begins with this. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to the word, according to thy word. So you know, we're talking about the, the work of the word of God, cleansing. And it goes on. For, for my whole heart, um, with my whole heart I have sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so this necessity of the presence of the Word of God is cleansing, it purifies, but it also, of course, uh, provides strength and, and substance in order to avoid um, sin in the future. And this is what we need. And so the church needs to emphasize the preaching of the Word of God so that we provide the opportunity not only for this cleansing in salvation, but this continual cleansing in the, in the lives of a believer and the strengthening of those believers to avoid sin in the future. If you don't know what the pitfalls are, then you're going to fall in them every time. And the preaching of the Word of God does that. The church needs to be a clean bride for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and um, you, you can't do that without a saved membership, and you certainly can't do that without the preaching, the constant, continual preaching of the Word of God. I want, to, I want to end with 2 Corinthians chapter 6. If you would please go with me there. We have been all over the place today. I appreciate you following it as you, as you can. And, uh, but 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm going to start in verse number 16. Um, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, we're, um, my, my goal was next week to talk about the, um, the term house of God and making uh, relation to um, the fact that we are, uh, you know, we're a temple individually. What makes you a temple of God individually? What makes you a temple of God individually? Brother Tyler? The presence of the Holy Spirit, exactly right, okay? So because God's Spirit dwells inside of you, that makes you a temple. But collectively, this is the temple of God. We meet together as a body of believers, okay, as a church, and each one of us, of course, the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, and we certainly do believe that God is present within our meeting. Um, he's in our midst, so we, we certainly do believe that. And... Um, but please notice, he makes the observation here. We're going to talk about those verses, uh, Lord willing, next week. But he makes the observation that, that, that we're the temple of God. And um, uh, let me see here. We're, we're, that was verse number 16, yes. Therefore, in verse number 17, this is, this is the responsibility we have, right? Therefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, this is, this is what he's doing by that statement. He's, he's, he's taking us all the way back to even those type of things we just read about in Haggai. You know, here's the priest, touches something unclean. Now he's unfit to serve, and whatever he does is now going to be unclean. So here he is talking to the individual believers, but also, I mean, of the application is made collectively to the church. <clears throat> but we need to... We need to, to sanctify or separate ourselves 
uh, from the contamination of the world. I mean, that's not locking ourselves up in you know, some monastic type of thing where we just kind of wall ourselves off from everything, but not allowing the world to contaminate our lives, our homes, um, our operation as a church, not just to, to not allow that type of stuff to, to infiltrate the ministry um, so that we're unclean. Because once the world is, is doing that, once we allow the world to do that, then whatever we produce is not going to be suitable to be used by God. It becomes unclean. Because what we touch now becomes unclean. So your separation is going to affect your service. So the, what's the, what is the church like? It's, it's like a spouse. It is this bride. And the goal, of course, uh, in, in the illustration there is that there, here's, Jesus is the, is, the, is the groom, and he wants to purify his bride and present her as, un, as, as clean. And, and so this is what Christ wants of us. He's coming back for us someday, and he is going to take us with him. And until that day, we want to be a pure church set apart for him, uncontaminated by the world, and about his business, keeping ourselves unspotted. Well, we're out of time. I want to thank you for your time this morning in Sunday school. We're going to talk more about the church, and uh, Lord bless you. Appreciate you being here today.